Hey everyone, today's guest is my friend Jake Coker Hans. So um, I am located in Utah, if you didn't know that, and so is Jake. Uh, Jake is a formerly nationally qualified men's physique competitor and has now become a holistic weight loss coach. He's got a few other business things in the works now, but um, he has been, you know, an influencer on the gram for for a long time and has really specialized in weight loss. Um, he's really talking on this, on the show today about his own journey. I wanted you guys to hear this because he really, to me, exemplifies what can happen in a person when they transition from this chronic chasing of aesthetic quote unquote fitness <laughs> to really dialing it back in and saying, wait a minute, how do I feel as a result of what I'm doing in my life? And he's, you know, he's a high performer. Now he's transitioned into eating and training in a way that builds his life, builds his business. Um, and I just think you're going to really appreciate the insights he shares from this. Cause it's, he's coming from a place of knowing, you know, I think a lot of people are, not, not everybody, but a lot of people are dazzled by this, you know, super, super extreme physique look, which he's achieved, you know, he's been well into the single digit body fat range, but he really talks about like what that was like for him. And then what he learned as he started to shift his focus onto something else. So anyway, really great on mindset. If you're wanting to kind of take a look and get some thoughts provoked on how am I looking at health and fitness and how might I look at it differently that might actually get me the results I'm after and bring me happiness and joy and fulfillment. So that's what we're talking about today. We'll go ahead and jump in. Here is Jake Coker Hans. Okay. Before we jump into the show, I've got a special announcement real quick, and it is about my higher retreats. We are finally rolling on this. This is a project that's been in the work for two years for me, and we are finally going. Our first higher retreat is going to be in April in Zion's National Park. I don't know if you've ever been to Zion, but oh man, it's in Southern Utah. It is incredible. Check out my Instagram for pictures if you haven't seen. It is just like one of the most magical places in the world. People come from all over the world to see this place. Um, so we are going to be doing it there April 21st through 24th, 2022. And I wanted to let you guys know, we are still in our early bird pricing right now. Um, we sold a lot of it. We filled more than half the retreat in our pre-sale, but we still have one shared room left. So if you want to come with somebody and save some money, jump on that. Um, I am doing this with be the wellness. They are helping me put on this retreat. Be the wellness is amazing. They're like my dream end goal of all retreats. And they've decided to help other people like me put on retreat. So it's going to be phenomenal. Their award-winning retreat, um, hosts and yeah, it's, it's going to be good. So you have to go to their website. It's going to be, be the wellness. So B E E make sure you follow them on Instagram, by the way, also, but B E E the wellness, be the wellness.com slash experiences slash higher. All of the details are there. You have pricing. Um, you can register right there on the website, all of the schedule, all of the people who are coming. We have a shaman coming to do a fire ceremony the first night. We have an amazing yoga, meditation, breath work facilitator, Catherine Dixon, who is like, I don't know what to call her. My like spiritual guide in life. <laughs> um, she is facilitates the work of Byron Katie and she has an episode here on inside out health. I would highly suggest listening to that. She is a life changer. She's going to be facilitating, um, two days at the retreat. So I'm so excited to have Catherine coming. She's like my secret weapon. She's amazing. So, um, yeah, all the details are on that website. Go check it out. Take advantage of the early bird pricing we have going um, for the next uh, week and a half. So that will end on, I guess maybe it's a little less than that by the time you hear this, that ends on August 8th at 8 p.m. So 888, okay? August 8th at 8 p.m. Mountain Time is when the early bird pricing ends. So if you want to get in on that, get in on that now. Um, and yeah, if this is something that's pinging, if you feel like you need a reset, connect to nature, connect with like-minded people, take a look inside at what you got going on and leave with some tools on how to control your stress response and challenge your stressful thoughts and find out what might be going on inside of you that you're just not seeing. This is going to be amazing. We have a sh private chef coming, all gourmet paleo meals. It's going to be incredible. So um, yeah, check that out. Be the wellness.com slash experiences slash hire. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults and their nanoparticle size minerals. 
So, um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away and I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test. There's no way to know. And you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of, exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios, right? So, um, yeah, take advantage of it guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount on to you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Okay guys. So this is Jake, Jake and I, we met like through probably through the gram back when we were like super uber fitness fanatics. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah that's really where you got your start was like bodybuilding and you built kind of this following on Instagram. And, you know, I wanted to talk about that journey because you were young when you got started, right? You were like a teenager, weren't you? Or like- yeah, it was, it was almost right out of high school. I was about nine, I think it was 19 or 20 when I did my first competition. Yeah. And so I, w- I was wondering if you could share your story of what that was like, because now you're like crushing business, you know, you've evolved out of that, you're still super fit, still super healthy, but I was wanting you to share the journey because I think so many people have this like rose colored glasses of like, if I could just, especially young guys coming up, I just want to look like Jake, you know, and it's, it's a very aesthetic focus and then people will love me and then I'll have all my value. And so I was wondering if you could share, take us through that journey and then take us out of that journey to where you are now. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So I would say in terms of my overall like weight training career, that probably started in high school when I first got into sports, playing football and baseball. Um, That was what really introduced me to weightlifting. I actually, one of our our strength and conditioning coaches for football, he actually did bodybuilding shows at the time. So, um, you know, very quickly I was kind of introduced to the sport and we would just talk back and forth about it a little bit because he was just yacked and Mm -hmm. I always thought it was really impressive. And then obviously as you continue to work out and train, you start to get some of the other benefits of, of lifting, right. More attention from, Mm -hmm. from the opposite sex or, you know, people who are attracted to you. And I think that was ultimately what spurred my initial passion or desire to keep strength training was kind of like those vanity metrics, you know, you feel good, you feel more confident. And I think ultimately that's kind of what led me into the idea of just chasing kind of like that ideal physique once I got out of high school um, very quickly because I've always had a passion for health and fitness very quickly after I graduated I ended up uh, going through my NASM certification I got certified as a trainer and started just just kind of learning the ropes um, mm-hmm. although at the time I mean I felt like I knew how to train for my own body I really didn't understand a lot of advanced nutritional concepts. <laughs> and, and so that, that was a recipe for disaster, uh, yeah. you know, getting ready for my first show, because going into it, my whole concept of what it took to really diet and lean out was, I genuinely think it was like eliminate all carbs and fat. And it was just like a high protein diet. It was Which so is- bad still happening to this day, only protein and quick. I'm going to just interject really quick. If you do not eat any fat, if you're trying to minimize fat, it's 
kills me for guys because they're basically writing off steroids. They're basically writing off, you know, these injections because they, they don't have the ability to make healthy testosterone levels when you're not eating any fat, not to mention brain power, right? So keto, you can kind of make it work because you at least have fats to fuel these basic vital functions in your body, like cell membranes, brain health, hormones. Mm -hmm. But when you take that away, like it puts you in this, uh, I honestly, I think like psychosis almost like you're not your normal self at all. So yeah, sorry. Just a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think the biggest mistake I made when I first decided to get into competing was not getting serious enough to hire a coach, right? Maybe that was mm -hmm. my ego or whatever, feeling like I don't need a coach. My whole life I've worked out. I know how to get in a decent uh -huh. shape. And so just going down that path and just doing what I thought was the appropriate thing. And, and I think what fueled this and this, this is another thing that I think such a big red flag that people, anybody who decides that they want to compete need to pay attention to is this whole martyr mentality that exists within the competing space of mm. it's, it's almost like a badge of honor of who can suffer more throughout yeah. prep. Like prep yeah. is just this gauntlet of suffering yes. that you go through where it's just endless cardio, starving yeah. yourself, you know, you hear people just post memes I, about. Oh. I stopped. I stopped calling it my bodybuilding competition. And I started calling it my starvation contest. <laughs> <laughs> Who can starve the best? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's what it felt like for sure, especially <laughs> when I was high protein. And and I think because of that mentality that everybody has within the space, it it put me in a position where I overlooked a lot of red flags or signals yeah. that my body was giving me that something was not right. Yeah. Because I don't care who you are, you go for any length of time, and I have no idea how many calories I was consuming, but probably not a lot. You go for any length of time where you're not consuming any carbs or fats, shit's going to break down, right? Yeah. I noticed my, I had a girlfriend at the time, my libido completely went to the yeah. toilet. Totally. Um, my energy was terrible. I remember, um, I remember peak week going into my first competition and feeling every single day, like I was... I would literally be at work and I would have moments where I would start to like black out. Like I would, I would feel so shitty, but I was like, Oh, peak week. Because at that point I'm cutting water too and sodium. So it's just Man, the it's worst so and doing all these things that I thought was what it took. I thought this is just, this is just the sacrifice that has to be made to yeah. compete at a high level in a competition. Right. Well, I ended up going and competing in my first show and didn't place for anything. I placed, wow. didn't place for novice, true novice, the open, wow. nothing. Wow. And that was a huge, that was a huge, uh, I guess, humbling experience for me because going in, I mean, I had always been known as like the, the jacked dude in high school or the fit guy or whatever. So it caused me to do a lot of, um, like reflecting on, you know, what, what causes, what, what went wrong. And, it was weird because even looking back at the progress photos that I had taken throughout that prep, I remember at like five, six weeks out, I was, I was stage ready. And then I, I think what ended up happening was that the remaining six weeks, my body just, my muscle just started atrophying and yeah. I started just losing muscle, losing muscle. I looked emaciated by the time yeah. I got on stage in comparison to week six, where I was, I was lean and whatnot. So it's just, that was a huge eye opener. Um, yeah. And that's when I really started to dive a lot deeper into understanding the science of nutrition. I didn't even know what macros were at the point at that time. So wow. it tells you how basic my level understanding of nutrition was at the time. Um, were you just going off of what other people had done that you heard? Oh, just eat white fish and chicken. I don't, I, I honestly don't even know. Yes, probably. I just <laughs> felt like intuitively Maybe it was just buzzwords that I've heard. Oh, carbs yeah. are bad or carbs right, are bad, or, right. or whatever it was. Like, I'm sure I was probably modeling someone, but it was just, yeah. it was just stupidity. Honestly, <laughs> there was no thought process to it. Um, but, but it also lit a fire under my ass after that, where I was like, there's no way, like, there's no way I'm going out like this. And so um, I started to follow the, the typical bodybuilding advice of mm -hmm. what you're supposed to do post-show, which is like, oh, bulk up, bulk. you know, yeah. yeah, dirty bulk. It's dirty bulk time, right. baby. I got to get that muscle back and proceeded to go another six months of just stuffing my face, uh, with as many calories as possible. It didn't, just, the, the funny thing about my mindset at that time as well was like, I, I would intentionally avoid vegetables or any nutrient dense food 
because I felt like they they were it, why would I waste like any amount volume. of volume a volume yeah like in my stomach on things that weren't going to provide me a ton of calories like i need crazy I need calories more than right. anything and so and then your going, poor mental health sorry to interrupt again but your poor worries. mental health you went from i have no brain power from this starvation i just went through to now i'm going to inflame the crap out of my body with all these inflammatory foods right so i mean your body's going through the ringer at that point yeah oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah the, the the pendulum swing from completely restricting and starving myself, feeling like crap, and then swinging to this dirty bulking phase where ex that's exactly what happened, like you said. And for some reason, I had this weird arbitrary goal. And this was actually my after my second competition, but I had this goal of going from 195 to 240. Oh, and wow. 240 was just a number that I had pulled out of a hat. Like there was just yeah. no, there was no <laughs> logic to that. I was like, yeah, I want to be 240. And so during that period of time when I was stuffing my face. Yeah. I got bigger and it, I was, I was reaffirming that part of my ego that wanted to see progress because I think a lot of guys, when they're trying to, trying to bulk, they look at two physical metrics to determine if they're moving in the right direction. One is the scale is the number going up. And the other one is like, how are my, how are the sleeves of my shirt fitting? Are yeah. my sleeves getting tighter? Right? Like am I filling my shirts out more? And so once again, very easy to overlook these red flags and signals your body's giving you because right. you're looking at these metrics that might appease your ego, but they really don't, they don't mean anything. Right. Yeah. And so I went through that whole process and yes, I got to that point where, Oh, it, it was probably the most depressed I've ever been in my life yeah, when I was bet. bulking and in a surplus, I would literally wake up after eight or nine hours of sleep. I would eat breakfast and then I would like, need to go back to sleep. I was so tired all the time. Um, I was getting sick like once a month. I was getting wow. sick all the time. I was very lethargic, wow. um, pretty much only had energy to go to the gym. And so uh, after after a few months of that, I think I ended up getting to 235. It The only thing that actually kind of reeled me back in and got me to, to start cutting again was another show, right? So right. I decided to prep for this next show and then the cycle repeats and I go back to cutting. Well, this time it wasn't as bad, right? I had a better understanding of nutrition. And um, I think I had built my metabolism to a point where I was, I never at this, this time in my competing career felt like I was really dying or starving myself, but it still requires a level of obsessiveness with what you're doing yeah. to the point where you are very restricted, right? Right. Um, went and competed, ended up taking first, which was awesome, qualified for nationals, uh, and then came out and at that point, after that show, uh, it, it was kind of difficult for me because I decided I wanted to take a break from competing, but I was still in this mindset of post-show, eat as many treats as possible because that's just part right. of the culture, right? People totally. come, you come off the stage, you're greeted with pizza and donuts and cookies and all of that stuff. And, right. and in my mind, it's like, man, I deserve this. I've worked so hard for three months. Mm -hmm. Like I deserve this food. Mm -hmm. And so I... I don't know how or at what point I recognize myself kind of entering into this binge cycle again, yeah. post show. But there was a point where I was like, listen, I, I need to get a grip on just how I'm balancing my, my nutrition in my life. I felt like pre uh, competition or pre bodybuilding. Uh, I, I was relatively balanced. I didn't really crave sweets that much. You know, I ate, healthy, but every now and again had something that yeah. you know, was maybe not the most ideal. And there, there was a decent amount of balance, but some, some weird flip, uh, in my, in my mind happened when I was competing mm -hmm. where I was, I was caught in this on the wagon, off the wagon type of mentality right. where it was just one extreme or the other. I was right. super restrictive and, and star myself and, probably a pain to be around socially because I was so meticulous and obsessive about every little morsel of food that I was eating, or I was just completely off the rail and, and mm -hmm. avoided healthy foods at all costs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that's a position that a lot of people get into. And I want to all obviously preface this by saying, like, I don't think that it's necessarily the sport itself that caused that. Obviously there's, there's certain components of it that 
that aid in, in people developing that mindset. But I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the sport of bodybuilding. I, I like to see people push themselves to their potential and to their limits. And I like this, you know, with, when you think of any professional sport, it does take a level of obsessiveness and sacrifice to get to the highest level. So I understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think a lot of people go in without fully understanding what can potentially happen. And I mean, it sounds like you even went in knowing that and still kind of succumb yeah. to it to a certain point, but yeah. And I, and I, I appreciate you sharing that because I, like I learned, I, I was shocked that for me it was, yes, I, I, before I got into it, I don't track my food. I don't, you know, I'm not meticulously watching calories or macros, but I eat healthy, you know, like I'll have salmon or I'll have a big salad or, you know, if I'm having a treat, it's like a, like a health bar or, you know, something like that. Or if Mm -hmm. I'm having chips, it's like siete foods and guac, you know, or something like that. But I did, I found that because I had been so restricted for so long, all of a sudden I was fantasizing about stuff I haven't eaten since I was fat. (laughs) I was like, I want cereal and I want brownies and I'm going to have pizza. And I literally, I remember there was a night, it was like peak week and I had to go just get some more rice cakes and white fish. And I remember plotting all the stuff at Harmon's that I was going to get. And I was like, on Sunday, you're eating that and you're eating that. And, and it's all junk food, all junk food. And I'm a plot, plotting it. And yeah, I, I was surprised that it, it got me like that. And it was what, like you said, if it was healthy, I did not want it. Any of my mm-hmm. old healthy foods that I normally ate, I'm like, screw that. I don't want yogurt. I don't want sweet potatoes. It's just like my favorite food. I don't want it. Goodbye. No, thanks. Yeah. Where are the burgers and fries and cake and waffles. And yeah, I, and, and I, I, the reason I like this, is not, not just to pick on like bodybuilding. It's honestly what I learned as I started talking about this on social media is it's also, it's like reg quote unquote, regular people too, who have been in diet culture mentality for so long for decades, even they've been pushing themselves of like, don't screw it up. Come on, eat good, eat good, eat good. And it says good, bad, black, white extremist mm-hmm. thinking. And so every time they go into that extreme restriction, they end up binging. And that's why I wanted to bring this up because like, yeah, we were in the extremes of that, you know, getting, what was, what'd your body fat get down to, by the way, at its lowest? No, I mean, based upon the machine that I was using was like four or 5%, but I, I, I don't, I don't know how accurate those are. I was yeah, doing but like still the stand like up body one. Yeah. Di- for sure. Single yeah. digit body fat, you know, mm-hmm. and our body from a survival mechanism standpoint does not want to do that. And so it's going to say it's good. Ghrelin. I read, by the way, Jake, I read in research that ghrelin can go up by 50% during a bodybuilding competition. That was oh, really research. Yeah. So you're hungry. That's what it feels so- like. Yeah. You just, it's almost like if, you, if you've ever smoked weed and had munchies really bad and you're like this maniacal monster overcomes your brain and it's like, eat all the things. That's what you kind of feel like the last several weeks of competition prep. But I think a lot of people can relate to this. And I, I want to bring awareness to this because I believe that all these like binging and overeating and disordered eating patterns come from the restrictive mentality in the first place. Because like you said, when you were in high school, yeah, you might eat cookies or a brownie or whatever, but you weren't thinking about it after you just ate the brownie and then went along your merry way. But if eating a brownie is a failure, well, now you're in this weird mindset, you know? And so now that's what leads to like fantasizing and obsessing about these things. So I think whether it's bodybuilding, it's an extreme level, or you're just kind of trapped in diet culture, I think there's the same lesson can be learned here that if you're in this super restrictive mindset around food, it is going to lead into this overeating, binging, disordered way of eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've thought about it a lot. And I I, I feel that there is some part of the human being that wants to rebel or push back against things when they feel like they're being forced to do something Mm -hmm. or they feel like they can't do Mm -hmm. something. There's some weird internal thing where you're, I don't know if it piques curiosity or whatever. I say it's our inner child. So (laughs) it is. Yeah. Your inner, (laughs) inner rebel. Yeah. It's just like the same kid who grows up in a super, super strict household. They're not allowed to do anything. Their parents are overbearing and yep. then they graduate and they just, they just go off the rails, you know, yep. they go party and do all this crap because it's all new and it's novel. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think is the biggest problem with 
people who put too many restrictions on what they can't do or even the verbiage that they use, like, I can't have this, right? When you know that you can't have it, the, you start to obsess over it. It's yeah. very, it's very strange. Um, and, and even a small, the smallest shift of saying like, you know, just giving yourself even a little bit of permission to enjoy it, it almost takes away the, yeah, this, the mystique of, of whatever it is that you're not allowed to have. Right. It's yeah. A hundred percent. And that's why, like for me, for like maintenance, for lifestyle, if I find myself even trickling towards like my kids are having pizza and I'm like, don't eat it, don't eat it. I will purposely just go have a bite here, go have a bite there. Just so I make sure that I don't get into this restrictive mentality. Cause I learned through the school of hard knocks. If I did that, I'm going to guess who's going to be end up having her salad now and like four pieces of pizza later tonight, me, Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, you're absolutely right. And so I want to transition into the rest of your story. So you did this, you qualified for nationals. Did you do nationals? No, I never did. So, so what happened from there? Um, I, I think I just got to a point where I I was kind of tired of competing. I mean, I had competed for three years. I kind of skipped through a a middle show. Right. But I I did Mm -hmm. three shows in total. It was over the course Mm -hmm. of three years. Um, I decided, cause I, I always competed naturally and I was just like, you know, I, I just don't think that I'm at a point where I could be competitive on a national stage naturally. Um, and so I just decided that I wanted to find balance. And that was also a big component was like realizing where my mental headspace was at and thinking like, man, I, I need to get a grip of this because I feel for the first time in my life, I feel out of control with my food, which was a, a totally new experience for me. And you know, I, I, I'm sure it was something that I read or that I had heard that allowed me to flip this switch, but it was the, the moment where I stopped looking at food for the way that it would change my physical appearance and started to look at food of much as something much more in the way that it manifested every time that I ate it. Mm. So thinking of food and how it impacted these other areas of my life, like my energy levels, my mental clarity, uh, my focus and productivity, how it affected yeah. my digestion, because that's another thing when I was doing the dirty bulking thing. I mean, I, my, the, my bloating and that just my yeah. stomach was not in a good place. My gut health was way off. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I started to to look at food in that way and then taking it even a step further, starting to think about these other important areas of my life. I mean, my work and my career has always been really important to me. I do a lot of time talking. I create a lot of content. And when I started to recognize the parallels of how food was actually impacting my creativity, my ability to come up with new creative ideas for content, my verbal fluency, the way that I would communicate with clients and even just like on podcasts or videos, the way that I'm able to articulate different ideas. I know I started to notice differences of how certain foods would affect me, Mm -hmm. my brain fog, my how my energy declined throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And so when I began to associate, oh, eating in a particular way will improve my performance in this area. uh, I subconsciously, maybe I was associating more pleasure to certain foods than I was previously. Whereas a lot of people, this is the issue that I think a lot of people have is when they look at food, the only association that they have to food is is taste, is how is this food gonna taste? So when they think of, what do I wanna eat for dinner? Well, what, what sounds good right now? What sounds good to me? And I mean, if that's your only compass that you're using to, to guide these decisions, then how likely are you to ever pick something more nutrient dense and healthy over something that's obviously processed and tastes delicious, right? Totally. Not very likely. So I think a lot of people operate just thinking about like what would taste good in this moment, but if you can start to create more deep rooted associations with how you want to feel yeah. on a physical and a, and a mental level, um, then I think it makes it a lot easier for you to look at these more healthy foods in a different way. Even though it maybe doesn't taste as good, that's fine because I know how I want to feel and I know how it's going to impact me career-wise or even just like in your relationships, how it affects your mood and your stress levels and your sleep and all these other things that are really important to people. Once you start to Once you start to make those connections, then it becomes much easier for you to seek out things that are going to be more advantageous for whatever is most important to you. And mm-hmm. that wasn't something that happened overnight. It was, it was like a slow yeah. uh, 
progression and transition into thinking like that. But now, I mean, I'm, I'm really at a place where most of the decisions I make around food or, or what I'm doing to my body to exercise is really, I mean, I care about how I look physically, but more than anything, like I want to feel good. Like I want to wake up yeah. and have tons of energy. I want to have mental clarity. I, I mean, I hate feeling foggy and, and just, just lethargic. Oh, wow. I, I can't stand feeling like that. And so I, I've figured out what foods make me feel great, what foods don't. And I think that's an important way that everybody should be looking at foods. And that's why I, I am a fan of food journaling and having people tr- be more conscious before and after when they eat something of how, how are they feeling? Like, what yeah. are they noticing? Are they noticing you know, that certain foods cause their skin to break out or cause them to get itchy or, you know, this happens. And I just don't think people realize all the different ways that food manifests itself. Once we consume it, people oh. think that it's just these two seconds of momentary pleasure and then it's over, but it's so much more than that. Right. I mean, our body literally recreates itself and that's what it's making it out of. Like the whole, you are what you eat is literally, you know, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. that's the building blocks of our body. And I think you're one, so ahead of the game on this. I feel like most people don't hit this until like maybe late thirties or early forties. You're like mid twenties ish, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're way ahead of the game on that. But, and that's why like you've, your, your career has been excelling, I think, because you're feeding for performance, you're eating for performance, you know? And of course, I know you still like to kill it in the gym and all of that. I, I think that's a part of us that will never lose. If once you love fitness and you understand that, that awesome moment of like pushing yourself and how good that feels. But like you I also, I eat for that. And I, I like, I want to make sure that I can perform. I want to make sure. And it's, you're right. It becomes easy. And this is why I love your message so much because it becomes when you're looking at donuts, you look at them, they, they actually don't look as appealing. Cause you're like, mm-hmm. yeah, but like for the next two hours, I'm going to feel like shit if I eat that or yeah. I could, if I really am that hard up for a treat, I could have like a quest hero bar or something. It's not the most optimal ingredients ever, but at least it's not going to be super inflammatory and cause my blood sugar to spike and drop and all of these things, you know, it's so for me, it's become, what can I eat instead that will like fill that desire I'm having that will make me feel awesome after. And then you just want to, it's your, your wants change, your desires for what you're eating change. When you look at this aspect of how am I going to feel after I eat that. And you're right. There's, I'd say most people, they don't have that awareness. They don't yeah. even think about the connection between the two. So really a hundred percent, what you focus on is so important. And as somebody who's been doing weight loss coaching and I work with clients, I think the most important thing that you could use to gauge whether or not you're on the right direction is, is how you are feeling. Because I think a lot of clients that I work with for weight loss usually in an attempt to just see quick results, just because they're so impatient with Mm -hmm. the process, that's what oftentimes leads them to take extreme approaches to both their nutrition and their workouts. That's what causes them to do hours and hours of cardio when they first start out and immediately cut their calories in half or immediately remove an entire macronutrient category like Mm -hmm. carbs or, or fats. And if you're, looking at purely physical metrics of progress, then, I mean, that person can argue, well, guess what? I lost 10 pounds this week or whatever. And they're, you know, they're seeing progress in the short term, but the reality is those extreme approaches, eventually you're gonna, your body's going to start to notice these, the breakdowns, just like I noticed in my first competition, you start to feel lethargic. You start to have low energy, low libido, more brain fog, all that stuff. And that's just a clear indication if you're, if you're starting to feel that way, whether you're trying to lose weight or whether you're trying to build muscle, that that's, it's not going to last. Like it's not right. going to be sustainable for the long term. And if you use feeling good as your North star to determine like how you're fueling your body with foods, usually your physical results, they're going to come as a byproduct, a yep. byproduct of you focusing on just seeking things out to feel good physically and energetically then you're going to get there. And even though it might not be as as fast, it's going to be a lot more sustainable and you're not going to feel miserable the whole time. And so I think that's so important to, to first really, really pinpoint, like, where is your focus and make sure that the focus is on 
feeling good. And I often, even with my weight loss clients, many times I'll talk to them about like, if we ever have to do any sort of reverse dieting, right? Maybe their metabolism shot because they, they Starved did exactly, they did exactly yeah. what I just said. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have to work to build the metabolism back up and slowly reintroduce calories. That can be difficult for a lot of people. Um, I've even interviewed on my podcast a few years ago, uh, a girl who recovered from anorexia and she shared her story of at that time, I mean, she wasn't eating anything and she had to do the same thing, rebuild her metabolism. And the thing that actually pulled her out of that, out of that mindset of anorexia and actually healed her was instead of focusing on working out as a way to burn calories, she started focusing um, on physical per, per performance and strength yeah. metrics and goals inside of the gym. Yeah. Because when she did that, when she shifted her focus from her body right. to her strength and her performance, right. that all of a sudden it, it requires a whole new thought process of how you yeah. look at food as well. Because if I want to, if I want to get stronger in my deadlift, then I can't go home and starve myself after my workout. I have to I have to get enough protein in. I have right. to seek out nutrient dense and wholesome foods. And so just by shifting her focus yeah. um, to where she could, because reverse dieting, when you're somebody who's trying to lose weight, it's a very frustrating process, right? You're like, I'm going in the opposite direction. This, it just mm-hmm. can be very conflicting for individuals, mm-hmm. but at least if you're focusing on physical or, sh- or performance and strength goals, you're getting these wins. You're, you're mm-hmm. getting validated or reaffirmed that things are happening. Things are moving in the right direction because you're mm-hmm. coming into the gym, you're hitting new PRs, you're feeling strong, you're feeling more confident. So instead of feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm going backwards. This is a joke. Why am I doing this? Like I should, right. I could just go back to like, you know, cutting my calories again and keep trying to lose. At least you're, you're, feeling good about what's happening. You're like, I'm getting stronger. I'm doing more push-ups. I can last longer, um, in in the gym or whatever. And so, I mean, man, your, your focus and intent is so, so important. I love what you're saying there about shifting your focus into something that's building and positive and, and winning, you know, like it's, it's crazy to think if we took that parallel of like, Oh, like losing, losing, losing is constantly, you know, we have associating losing with winning. (laughs) Like think about that in other areas of your life. Like you want to make less money. You want to start chipping away at your house. That's a good thing. You know, like if we can just shift our focus into getting stronger, then we're in this constructive, nurturing, building, um, fun, energetic space, you know, and I I love that I've stopped doing weight check-ins with my clients. We don't do weight anymore. I'm like, how are you feeling? And we do a photo check-in once a month. Cause it's like, you know, if you're making progress and you're feeling good and your mental health's better and you're feeling stronger in the gym and how your clothes are fitting, that is enough. You know, like, Mm -hmm. especially when you're trying to gain strength, I just say the scale is a terrible indicator of of, um, success when you're trying to build muscle. It's like, that's not, you could have made massive progress. And if you think a lower number on the scale is better and you just actually lost half a pound of body fat and gained half a pound of muscle, well, now you're going to think I'm not making any progress, you know? And it's like, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love, I love that perspective so much. Um, I think also, I think we're starting to get away from this, from diet culture, from like, you know, I can't say how many clients I've had. You probably did too. They've done like HCG or they've done those like bar diets where you eat these bars and you have like one meal and like they all rebound. Every single one of them ends up gaining more weight after that than they did before. And it's probably similar to what we went through because you've been so restricted for so long. You're like, I can't do this anymore. I hate health and fitness. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is like, let's get away from this negative connotation with it, where it has to be all suffering and misery. And let's build into something that makes us feel good and perform better and show up better at work and show up better in our relationships. And I know what you're saying is true because it applies to many areas. Cause if you shift your focus in your, you know, relationships or your business into like building something positive, it's true across the board, you know? And so, and how do yeah. you feel is the biggest question, you know, who are you hanging out with? How do you feel afterwards? Pay attention. You know, what are you doing at work? How do you feel after work? Pay attention. And we start to pay attention. Then it becomes easier to shift what we're doing because we are aware of what it's actually bringing to our lives. And if that's something we really want or not. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if you even getting a little woo woo or energetic with it, right. I mean, it's like when you're always thinking of that end goal and 
experiencing that separation every single day when you wake up because you're like, oh, I'm still not where I want to be. Right. That's what puts you in that state of lack. That's totally. what puts you in that that state of desperation. And I mean, generally when you're in that state, that's where the impatience comes. That's where the frustration comes. Right. And it's like, you're not going to be resourceful. And you know, you're never going to achieve anything when you're in that state. Totally. And so the more that you can focus on the small wins, I call them yeah. non-scale victories or whatever, the, right. the things, the, the, all the ways that you're progressing outside of just that number on the scale, the things that happen immediately, that the small wins that within the first week, you can feel the difference between your stress levels, energy, mental clarity, digestion, how you're sleeping, your skin complexion, your strength in the gym, right. all of these different things. Right. When you can start to focus on those, then, then you're in a state of just abundance, right? You're feeling right. good. You're feeling good about what's going on. You're in no rush, no, no hurry because things, because you're focusing on things that are actually um, progressing at this point. So, right. And when you feel so like a winner, you win, you make choices like a winner. You know, this is something I tell my clients when we stay in this pressured energy and this could go with your, how you're doing as a parent or how you're doing in your job. If you're like, I'm not doing good enough, not doing good enough. You will, you're pushing your vibrational energy down into shame, guilt, fear, and these low vibrational energy. So what do you do when you're in a low vibrational energy? You make low vibrational choices because that's mm -hmm. how you perceive yourself. And when you push yourself up and you're like, dang, my skin is looking really good, man, I'm happier. Dude, I have noticed I've had so much energy. I'm not taking an afternoon nap. Wow. You know, and you give yourself that you feel like a winner. You're put, empowering yourself into these higher vibrational energies. And then you keep making choices from a higher vibrational place. So it's yeah. so important to pay attention to giving ourselves credit. Cause I remember when I got down to my goal weight, when I was in this, you know, have to do better lack mentality. And guess what? When I got to my goal weight, it, I couldn't enjoy that either because I was not trained. I had my tr psyche was not trained mm -hmm. to appreciate what is. So it was like, okay. And so what now, what, you know, What's the next thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah or it's you, still not good enough. Yeah. It, even if you make your goals from that place, it will never be good enough. It's this dangling yeah. carrot that just keeps moving ahead. And until we give ourselves that and I, it challenges people, it challenges my clients. I've, I've gotten lashback on it. I'm like, if you can't love your body as it is right now, you will not ever you will not ever, no matter how fit you get. I mean, you've seen it in bodybuilders. How many bodybuilders mm -hmm. do you know that look like these specimens? They look like the fittest people you've ever seen in your life. And they're like, oh no, dude, I gotta, I gotta Super work. Insecure. Yeah. Right. I gotta work. Oh, I'm so chubby right now. They've got a six pack. Oh, I, I yeah. really, really got to bring up my back. You know, it's, this is never enough. And yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's this, it's this false belief that we have that somewhere outside of where we are right now will bring us happiness. We have to choose that. We have to give it to ourselves. And kind of going back to what you were saying earlier is when you appreciate your body and you love your body and you're like, I want my body to perform like a boss. That's when everything starts going up. Those, those physique goals and all of that come as a byproduct, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like, Oh, wow, I'm actually looking pretty good. Wow. But you're, what you're chasing is nurturing and, and love self-love honestly all the time and the choices that you're making. Now I know I have pizza sometimes that I fully honor that. I'm like, this is delicious. I love earth life. Thank you for pizza. You know? And I think yeah. having that energy about it also helps me stay in a higher vibe place where I'm not like binging on pizza or, you know, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. And I mean, especially when you're, when you're constantly stressed, and, right. and just feeling this, this angst or this, this pressure to be right. further than where you are. I mean, right. you're not you're putting yourself in this kind of chronic, chronic fight or flight state, right. which is inhibiting the, the progress that you're so desperately wanting. Amen. And so you really have to learn to just let go and allow, because yeah. otherwise you're going to be stressing yourself. You're actually the one thing that's holding yourself back. Cause we all know how much stress and sleep impacts your ability to progress when right. you're talking about like physical goals of any sort. Totally. And so, and so, uh, yeah, you really just have to learn to let go and focus on the things that are progressing and yeah, yeah just shifting your focus. I mean, it's so much of a mindset game. Yeah, it, really it is. is. It's a hundred percent. And gratitude I find is the, the quick ticket there. So if you're mm -hmm. feeling like you're not enough in your business, you're not enough as a parent, not enough in relationships, not enough in your body. When you flip to gratitude, 
you're, you're, you, it instantly brings you into that place. Like, holy crap. I'm so grateful that I have legs. I'm so grateful. I have hands. I'm so grateful. I breathe. Holy crap. My body heals itself. I'm like Wolverine. This is so cool. You know, and <laughs> flip into gratitude. It makes, it pulls you into that abundant state and now you're in peace. And I have found, and I know you have too, anytime you get out of that fight or flight or fear or rushed or not enough, and you switch into gratitude and abundance, you attract all those things that you mm-hmm. were actually pushing away when you were in that fight or flight mode. You know, they come to you. It's beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's like the, the second you let go, that's when everything starts to pour in. It's in, a, in all cases, oftentimes. Yeah. Well, Jake, so thank you so much. I know we get, we got to cut this off because we both have appointments, but if you guys want to follow Jake on Instagram, is it Jake? I know I say your name yep. wrong all the time. Is it K- Coker Hans? Yeah. I got it, it finally. At okay. Jake so, Coker Hans. Yeah. So that's K O C H A Coker. Co- yeah. Hold on. Okay, hold on, hold on. <laughs> K-O-C-H-E-R-H-A-N-S. Jake Coker Hans. So you guys can find him. I'll tag him and all of his things below this, but he puts on a, a, a ton of good content actually for upcoming fitness trainers. He has a wide variety of stuff on his Instagram there and he's got some other cool projects. And I'm so proud of you and seeing all the progress that you've made in the last like three or four years has been astounding. And I, I think a lot of that comes from just that self-love approach of like, I want what's best for me and I choose what's best for me, you know? So it's, it's really cool. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jake, for coming on. Of course. Thanks Tara. I'll talk to you later. <laughs>